Ever bombed a presentation, Chris? Mine was a total disaster. Really? Doesn't sound like you, Olivia. Believe it or not, early in my career, and I mean really early, I was a young and eager intern at a tech company. I was responsible for presenting a new branding strategy. That sounds like a big task for an intern. It was. I worked really hard on it. Late nights, extra research, you name it. But when the day came to deliver the result of all my hard work, I tanked. How so? Let's just say I was underprepared, overconfident, and pretty clueless about the art of business storytelling. That's rough. What happened next? Something that we're going to be talking about today. Transformation. It was a wake-up call, and I used that epic fail to sharpen my presentation skills. That's something I think our listeners will find useful. Absolutely. Nobody is born a great presenter. That's true. And while some might have a natural knack for it, the real secret, as we'll see in today's episode, lies in skills that can be learned, honed, and mastered. Think of a great presentation as a delicious sandwich, Chris. There are various layers, but everything comes together to create an impactful experience for the audience. Uh, a sandwich, huh? That's a unique way to put it. Yes, each layer being a different yet essential part of your presentation. At the bottom, you have your bread slice, that's your introduction. This is where you set the tone, capture your audience's attention, and introduce your topic. Think of it as first impressions. You must make it count. So what's the next layer? It's the lettuce, your key points. This is where the main substance of your presentation lies. It's important to identify and articulate the pivotal ideas you wish to convey. But remember, brevity is key. You don't want to lose your audience's attention with unnecessary details. Oh yes, I've sat through presentations that felt like marathons. So much information, very little of it actually relevant. That's a common mistake. Exactly. And after your key points, comes your meat or your evidence. Supporting data, case studies, or testimonials. They substantiate your key points and build credibility. And finally, the top bread slice your conclusion, which should provide a succinct summary and reiterate the action you want your audience to take. I see. What's the role of sauce in this sandwich? Great catch. The sauce adds flavor. It's your delivery, your body language, your storytelling skills. Don't forget, you're not just presenting, you're performing. It's showtime. When presentations aren't working, Chris, do you think it's always the content? Sometimes it's not about what you're saying, but how we're saying it, isn't it, Olivia? Exactly. And another key aspect to this how is the structure of a presentation. So while our sandwich analogy covered the basic layout, there's more to it. The storytelling format can make or break a presentation. For instance, you could use a linear narrative, where you start at A and smoothly transition through Bs and Cs to eventually arrive at Z. Like a journey. Yes. Sort of. It's like starting from the problem you're trying to solve and gradually building up to the resolution. But sometimes, a non-linear narrative can be more effective, especially when your story involves multiple characters or parallel threads. In such cases, you can keep alternating between different parts of your story to sustain audience interest. Chris, you've pitched for Neural Nest. How do you generally structure your presentations? Well, in tech pitches, I generally opt for a hybrid approach, kicking off with a brief about the problem we're solving, a demo of our solution, and then backtracking to the underlying tech and market potential. It's kind of like a teaser trailer full story format. That's a great way to pique the investor's curiosity right from the get-go. But I reckon, whatever the format, the key is to pace your presentation correctly, isn't it? Absolutely. I've seen many presenters lose their audience because they rushed through their slides or dragged on for too long. An ideal presentation should be like a well-crafted movie, each scene perfectly timed to elevate the story you're trying to tell. Olivia, communication is like a dance, isn't it? Especially when it comes to business presentations. We must be aware of the kind of language we use and the phrases that steer it. Indeed, Chris. And dance is so much better when you know the right steps. How about we bring up some useful phrases to navigate that presentation dance floor? Sounds like a plan. 
so let's get started right from the beginning. An excellent way to initiate your presentation can be by setting the stage with phrases like Today, we aim to explore, or the focus of our discussion will be. That's a good start, Chris. And for transitioning between sections, we can use phrases like moving on to our next point, or now let's shift our attention to. Absolutely. Being language conscious helps maintain the overall flow. Lastly, for wrapping up, we might use to conclude or summing up to signal the closure of your presentation. Excellent choice of phrases, Chris. Now let's have a small role play to see these phrases in action. How about I play the role of a tech startup CEO pitching to investors and you be the hard-to-impress investor? You're on, Olivia. Let's get this role play started. Chris, I think that we've all fallen into the trap of dressing up our presentations with complex jargon. I can certainly relate to that, Olivia. When I was starting out, I thought that using technical words would make me sound more convincing. But you soon realized that it had the opposite effect, didn't you? Exactly. In fact, it turned my audience off. They either didn't understand what I was saying or thought I was just throwing around fancy words. And that's a lesson that's universal, regardless of your field. Whether you're in tech like you, Chris, or in marketing like me, the key to effective communication is simplicity. Indeed. That isn't to say that we need to dumb down our presentations. Rather, it's about putting our ideas across in a way that everyone can grasp. So, instead of saying our solution streamlines workflow processes, one could say our solution makes work easier and faster. Right. And instead of we're facilitating accelerated MMPs, a more straightforward phrase would be we're making more products faster. Sometimes we all need these reminders, don't we? Using correct business language isn't about impressing with complexity, but communicating clearly. And achieving that requires us to shed our fondness for jargon. I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Olivia. As presenters, our main goal should always be to clearly and directly convey our message and not confuse or alienate our audience with fancy, hard-to-understand terms. Engaging the audience it's perhaps the most challenging and the most important aspect of presentation, isn't it, Chris? True, Olivia. We all know the struggle of facing an indifferent audience while presenting. But let's discuss how we can flip the coin to our favour. Definitely. I regret not learning it earlier, but asking direct questions during a presentation can be an excellent way to maintain audience attention. Questions make your audience think actively and keep them engaged. That's a great point, Olivia. Just a note of caution here. You should ensure your questions aren't too complicated or awkward for the listeners. The last thing you want is silence following a question. Absolutely. Make sure your questions are simple, to the point, and relevant. For instance, if you're discussing the effects of climate change, a question could be as straightforward as, Are you worried about the future of our planet? That's a relevant example. You are essentially surveying your audience and getting their real-time feedback, which can help you adapt your narrative according to their responses. Another method I've used is to involve audience in a mini-exercise. Let's say you're discussing productivity. You could ask your audience to think about one small change they could make, improve their productivity, and have them share with a pair. This not just keeps them involved, but also helps them retain your message. Those are some novel ideas, I must admit. I haven't tried those yet in my tech presentations. Maybe it's time to incorporate them and see how they work out. Chris, we've both advocated for asking questions, but I'm wondering, should the presenter answer their own questions or leave it open to the audience? I think it depends on the context, Olivia. If it's a facilitative question, asking for opinions or perspectives, you'd obviously want to wait for your audience to respond. In case of rhetorical or reflective questions, you could answer them yourself to drive home a point or lead into your next segment. Remember to pause, giving your audience sufficient time to think and process. That's a good point. I guess it also depends on the time constraints, doesn't it? If you're running against the clock, you might need to answer your questions to keep things moving. Exactly. Time is a crucial factor in presentations. But I'd say, if time permits, audience involvement should be prioritised. Indeed. Audiences tend to remember more when they actively participate, 
not just passively listen. Another technique I've found effective is using technology to involve your audience. Polls, quizzes, interactive sections in your presentation slides. Of course, use them where appropriate. Yes, tech can undoubtedly enhance engagement. I recall an interesting example here. A presenter used a live word cloud generator where the audience could text their words to a given number and it appeared live in his slides. The point was to gather real-time opinions and it indeed kept everyone involved. That's innovative. It also ends up creating a memory for your audience. They'll remember your presentation each time they come across the concept of word clouds in the future. Absolutely. Memory hooks like that are so powerful. Storytelling. It's a tool as old as human civilization. It's something we've been utilizing since the cave paintings. Embracing this ability in a business context is, therefore, anything but surprising. In fact, it's indispensable. I couldn't agree more. Storytelling has this unique capacity to make complex ideas come alive, forge connections and evoke emotions. If utilized effectively, it can transform a mundane presentation into an unforgettable experience. There are different kinds of stories that we can use in business. We have visionary stories that paint a picture of what we aspire to achieve. There are also stories about how we overcame challenges, the so-called overcoming the monster narrative. And of course, the common personal stories that give us, the business owners, a chance to connect with our audience on a human level by sharing our trials and triumphs. Right you are. And being able to tie these stories to the key messages in your presentation, that's where the real magic happen. It's not about just telling any story. It's about choosing the right story that can embody your message, amplify it, and make it linger. On that note, do you have any particular strategy or trick in tying the story with the key messages? Well, it's not a trick, but a technique, if you will. I always make sure the essence of the story and the essence of the message are aligned. In other words... They should be singing the same tune. This makes tying them together seamless and the overall narrative coherent. That does sound interesting. In essence, what you're saying is, every story told should reflect the ethos of the message and vice versa. Exactly. That's how we ensure a captivating business presentation that truly resonates with our audience and leaves an impact. Hey, Olivia, do you remember Steve Jobs' iPhone launch presentation? Oh yes, how can anyone forget that? It was groundbreaking. Exactly. Now there's an excellent example of effective storytelling in a presentation, from unveiling the revolutionary product, an iPod, a phone, and an internet communication device, all rolled into one to building up the anticipation by repeatedly emphasizing these three distinct features Jobs held the audience's attention captive. The story he painted about this one device was so immersive that when he finally introduced the iPhone, it was nothing short of a phenomenal climax. And that, listeners, is the magic of storytelling. Couldn't agree more. Another business leader who uses storytelling remarkably is Richard Branson, the founder of Virgin Group. I've noticed that he often integrates personal anecdotes into his speeches. Take, for instance, when he was rolling out his airline business. Branson opened up about his tiring experience of being bumped off a flight. In a way, that was his entrepreneurial turning point. He didn't just sell airline services. He sold the story of bettering the customer experience inside an airplane, which eventually put Virgin Atlantic on the map and struck a chord with many frustrated air passengers. Ah, that's a classic one, Olivia. And don't forget his usage of humor, adventure, and suspense. It's a fantastic cocktail that keeps the audience hooked. Indeed. So listeners, as we analyze these successful business presentations, the common thread is storytelling. Jobs told a tale of technology. Branson painted a story of customer experience. They connected with their audience on a deeper level, leaving an indelible impact. Take a leaf out of their book, weave engaging stories into your presentations, and watch the magic unfold. You know, I've watched countless presentations in my life. Some amazing ones that kept me engrossed till the very end. And some, well, not so much. Olivia, what about you? Oh, absolutely. There seems to be a pattern with these underwhelming presentations, don't you think? I can recall several mistakes that repeated themselves. Let's break it down. 
One mistake I often see is related to visuals. More specifically, slides that are overcrowded with text. It's a common misstep, considering we all want to convey as much information as possible, but it ends up being counterproductive. An overload of information distracts the audience from the presenter's message. Instead of improving understanding, it just brings confusion. I totally see your point, Chris, and couldn't help but agree. Not only does it look unappealing, but it also dumps a lot of cognitive load on your audience. Keep your slides simple, listeners. Less is more. Bullet points are your best friend. Use them. Another common mistake that I've observed is pacing. Either presenters sprint through the information without pauses, or they meander around their points, taking an eternity to get to the crux. This could be quite irksome for the audience. It's like reading a book where the chapters are either too long or too short. Both are as equally annoying. Oh, Chris, that is a great comparison. You're spot on with the pacing issue. The key is finding a rhythm in your delivery. A story that's told at a steady pace, pausing at right moments to let the information sink in, is what engages your audience. Exactly, Olivia. Essentially, giving a presentation is akin to delivering a performance. It's about telling a story while keeping your audience hooked. Chris, you mentioned feeling a bit apprehensive about presentations earlier. Could you tell us more about it? Sure, Olivia. I would say it is a bit of stage fear. Every time I have to present, especially in front of a large group, there is this sense of nervousness that creeps in. Looking at all those eyes focused on me makes me feel like I am under a lot of pressure to perform. That's brave of you to share. And I am certain many of our listeners feel the same way. Stage fears or public speaking fears are common, even among seasoned professionals. But it's all about how we manage and transform that fear into something productive. How about we share some practical exercises that has worked for us? That's a fantastic idea, Olivia. One thing that really works for me is extensive preparation. I practice my presentation till I can recite it in my sleep. This helps not just with the content, but also the delivery, the pace, the pauses, everything. Makes sense. Familiarity breeds confidence. And while we are at it, let me add. Practicing in front of a mirror helps too. It allows you to watch your body language, facial expressions and gestures. You can then adjust them to your liking. I second that, Olivia. All these minute changes can significantly enhance the impact of your presentation. Now, if only I could remember all these tricks when the spotlight's on me. Well, it's like a muscle, Chris. The more you exercise, the stronger it gets. In anxiety, it's a natural response to unfamiliar or challenging situations. Accepting this can be our first step to manage our fears, and then transforming them into a motivating force. So, Chris, visuals and presentations. I've seen your slides. They're quite impressive. Yet, I'm intrigued. Do you think there's a standard format for designing slides, or does it vary according to the nature of the presentation or audience? Good question, Olivia. I believe there's a need for balance. The design should complement the content. You shouldn't have an extremely formal design for a casual presentation, and vice versa. Same with the nature of the audience. I couldn't agree more, Chris. After all, the purpose of visuals is to aid understanding and retention, not to distract the audience. Speaking of aids to understanding, how often do you use charts or graphs in your presentations? Quite often, actually. They can be very helpful in breaking down complex data. But one thing I try to avoid is overcrowding the charts with too many details. Audience can lose track of what's important. Simplicity is the key. Exactly. In fact, not just charts. Every slide should preferably focus on one key idea. Also, I feel a coherent color scheme and use of fonts that match the overall tone of the presentation can subtly add to its overall effectiveness. What do you think? Certainly, Olivia. Coherence and consistency lend a professional feel to the presentation. Just like in coding, it's all about choosing the right tool, or in this case, the right visual elements for your messages. Indeed. And let's not forget that sometimes, less is more. Overloading slides with visuals can confuse or overwhelm the audience. While it's important to be visually engaging, the focus should always remain on the key message. So, Olivia, 
No matter how prepared we are, the fear of public speaking can be debilitating at times. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, Chris. In fact, I would call it one of my personal demons. I have had my share of moments of fear and nervousness before presentations. Honestly, it was quite unsettling at first. We both have had our fair share of those moments. Over time, I found certain exercises to be quite helpful in managing stage fear. For instance, practicing deep breathing exercises before the presentation can help calm the nerves. Also, going through the presentation out loud multiple times not only builds confidence but also makes it feel more natural. That's really insightful, Chris. I remember a time early in my career when I was so overwhelmed by nervousness that I completely blanked out in the middle of a presentation. It was a real wake-up call. From then on, I made it a point to utilize visualization techniques. Prior to any presentation, I would mentally walk through the entire process, visualizing myself delivering it confidently. It may sound cliché, but it helped immensely with my nerves. Absolutely, Olivia. Visualization is a powerful tool. It basically conditions the mind to handle the actual event better. Practicing mindfulness and staying in the moment can also help avoid anxiety triggered by overthinking. And as they say, practice makes perfect. The more you expose yourself to public speaking opportunities, the more comfortable you become. Yes, comfort comes with exposure and experience. And let's not forget to mention the power of positive affirmation. Telling myself I can do this before a presentation always gives me a morale boost. Indeed. Positive reinforcement can have a powerful psychological impact. Remember, it's okay to be nervous. The aim is to manage the nerves, not to eradicate them entirely. After all, a bit of adrenaline can actually enhance your performance by keeping you alert and energized. How fast should one speak during a presentation, Chris? That's an interesting question. I've seen many presenters who rush through their slides, probably because of their nervousness. But speed is crucial. It can determine whether or not your audience comprehends your message. However, every presenter is unique and should find a pace that matches their natural rhythm and one that ensures their audience follows along. Oh, it's a balancing act then. What about when taking questions from the audience? Any tips on handling that? As I see it, anticipating potential questions beforehand is very helpful because it gives you the chance to prepare solid answers. However, the key is to remain open and welcoming. When you invite questions, you make your audience feel heard and valued. In case of unexpected or tricky questions, it's okay to admit that you don't have the answer on hand, but promise to follow up later. That's a fine line to walk, Chris. I believe the most important thing is to remain authentic and true to your style. Energy is crucial as well. The presenter's energy can influence the room's energy, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. A lively and engaged presentation can energize the audience and keep their attention. Techniques to maintain high energy levels could include varying your speaking pace and tone, using strong body language, and injecting a touch of humor or interesting anecdotes from time to time. However, as with everything, the context and audience should dictate the style of your delivery. A presentation isn't completed when your last word is delivered, right, Chris? Exactly. The journey doesn't end with your conclusion slide. Feedback is vital. It's the one way you can truly measure the effectiveness of your presentation and note the areas for improvement. Without feedback, you are left in the dark, unsure if your message resonated with your audience or not. So true. But feedback can't be a one-time thing, right? It needs to be an ongoing process. Absolutely, Olivia. Gathering feedback should be part of the presentation process. We need to create ways for ongoing engagement with our audience, which could be as straightforward as sending survey links after the presentation or catering to Q&A sessions post-event. Moreover, don't overlook the value of self-evaluation. Regularly revisiting our performance helps highlight our weaknesses and strengths. Couldn't agree more. But Chris, how does one handle criticism or negative feedback? It can be a bit unnerving, don't you think? It certainly can be challenging, Olivia. But it's important to remember that negative feedback, when constructive, isn't an attack on you personally. Rather, it's an opportunity to improve and grow. Keep an open mind, acknowledge the feedback, 
and formulate an action plan to address those areas. That puts things in perspective. So in essence, feedback isn't just about receiving critiques. It's about acquiring insights to refine our presentation skills and deliver more impactful presentations in future. Indeed. Always remember, perfecting a presentation is an iterative process. Our goal is to better ourselves with each presentation through continuous feedback and self-improvement. Embrace each feedback session as a learning opportunity and a step closer to mastery.